Hello and welcome to the Wolf's Den. I'm Dave here with Mary Ellen and today we are going to be breaking down Daenerys's second point of view chapter which basically takes place at her wedding with Khal Drogo. Absolutely. So um, the chapter uh, begins by explaining the setting a little bit and being uh, Dothraki, the wedding celebration would be taking place beneath the open sky in a field just beyond the walls of Pentos. We learned that Drogo had called his Kalazar to attend and they had come. 40,000 Dothraki warriors and uncounted numbers of women, children, and slaves. We learned that Drogo had given over his estate to Danny and her brother until the wedding and also that Jorah had sworn his sword to Viserys on the night she had been officially sold to Drogo. Something interesting here, and we've mentioned this before just very quickly, the fact that Drogo has a manse is interesting and makes him unique among the Dothraki. Not to mention all of his friends and stuff, but we talked about that in the first one. And I would say... It's kind of like really weird that they keep referring to it as they sold her to him. But the Dothraki don't buy and sell. Yes. So it, it is like a weird thing. It, it is like if it's more of a if I marry your sister, I will let you use my army. That's not the same as like selling. That's like... A little bit different. Well, and we also learn in this chapter that Illyrio obtained some things because of this exchange as well. Which also tells you a little bit that Drogo is a little bit different because Drogo, there's only two people with money in this scenario. Viserys doesn't have any money. So, for Drogo, or for Illyrio, to have obtained great wealth and stuff from this arrangement, it had to have come from Drogo. Absolutely, which it, it says he obtained great wealth uh, in this chapter. Yeah, Danny brings it up when it comes to the time for the gifts. Absolutely, you're right. That's where it is. So, I find the entire th this entire scene is actually, at the very least, the first half of this chapter is relatively interesting, especially... I would say getting back to the fact that she's staying at Drogo's because this is where it gets very interesting because Danny listens to Viserys being stupid. Uh, he better do what I say. I hate Dothraki. I don't want, I want it to happen now. Getting impatient, acting like he is tough and then threatening to rip Jorah's tongue out for he's like a lesser man can ask a call for a favor but he doesn't make demands right and he was kind of trying to help him but Viserys is such an idiot that he threatened to rip the guy's tongue out it's normal so goes home the dragon doesn't beg and blah 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 Danny thinks to herself there are no more dragons right yes but then she dreams of the dragons. Yes, that yet yeah, that night she had dreamt of one. Uh, so I was going to actually... I think uh, it'd be a good idea to read it. Yep. Yet that night she dreamt of one. Viserys was hitting her, hurting her. She was naked, clumsy with fear. She ran from him, but her body seemed thick and ungainly. He struck her again. She stumbled and fell. You woke the dragon, he screamed as he kicked her. You woke the dragon, you woke the dragon. Her thighs were slick with blood. She closed her eyes and whimpered. As if in answer, there was a hideous ripping sound and the crackling of some great fire. When she looked again, Viserys was gone. Great columns of flame rose all around, and in the midst of them was the dragon. It turned its great head slowly. When its molten eyes found hers, she woke, shaking and covered with a fine sheen of sweat. 
She had never been so afraid. All right. So there's a lot to talk about in this one paragraph. Agree. A, what we've already brought up before in the Drogo videos. She has her first dragon dream. Seemingly the first time she was near the dragon eggs. Which were at Drogo's palace, not Illyrio's. Correct. Because she's not at Illyrio's palace. She's at Drogo's palace the first time that she has a dragon dream. And this dragon dream is you woke the dragons. You woke the dragon. The eggs came alive in her presence. She woke the dragon. Yes. So it repeats it. You woke the dragon. You woke the dragon. You woke the dragon. Three times. Correct. There are three dragon eggs. Yes. She woke the dragon three times. Yes. So she woke three dragons in this dream. Correct. Her thighs were slick with blood. I don't really know what that means. Is is that something about like... I think that the her thighs were slick with blood is foreshadowing for events that take place later in this in this book, this actual book, you know, not the series, but that it's foreshadowing of the loss of her child, which was a major domino in the events that took place that led up to the, the birthing of the dragons. It also kind of reminded me when I was listening to it and I turned to you and I said, I go, are we listening to the right chapter? Because in some ways, the way that this is described, this entire thing, she ran from Viserys. She was thick and ungainly. We know later in this book, she is with child, maybe a little uh, thick, thick and, ungainly, and ungainly, and he is coming after her in some ways. And she is not maybe literally running from him, but cowing from him. I can get down with that. So some of this is like, uh, I feel foreshadowing for stuff that happens later that leads to all of these dragons being woken from the stone. And then I think the second part is also very prophetic, if you will. When she closes her eyes, she hears a ripping sound and crackling of some great fire. When she opens her eyes, Viserys is gone, and now there's dragon. Yes. Just, just like in, in the actual story. Viserys is gone, and now there are dragons. Right, she, Viserys is gone. She loses a baby. She's running from him, and then there's dragons. And then there's dragons. Um, then it turned its head. It was scary. That, that We can kind of move on from there, but the early part of the dream, right up until the end, uh, three-quarters of the way through this little description of the dream, I, I find that all fairly fascinating. I agree. All right. Then it gets into the description of the ceremony itself, going from dawn and continuing till dusk, an endless day of drinking and feasting and fighting. Uh, she's sitting above Viserys. Viserys can't stand it. Uh, they're, fe they're letting Drogo and her choose and making him choose from what was left over that right. they didn't want. He is getting more and more angry by the day. It's getting kind of worse and worse and worse. People are getting drunker and drunker. They see the first fight, which is like the very bizarre, we'll say bizarre behavior. Um, Danny is feeling very isolated and alone. Yes, despite being in a crowd of an immense group of people, we you know 40,000 screamers, and not to mention women, children, and slaves, she feels completely alone. She doesn't speak their language. She's sitting next to her husband, who doesn't speak her language, and she's feeling frightened, as one would. Uh, she even wishes, I wish I could talk to even Illyrio, Viserys, and maybe Jora, even, even though she doesn't really know him yet, but they would be able to speak back to her. She actually thinks that she would even like to talk to Viserys. Yes, because um, this is a, she's very uncomfortable in this moment. This is pushing her really outside of her comfort zone. So um, it's at this moment that she starts to say to herself the mantra, I am blood of the dragon. I am Daenerys Stormborn, princess of Dragonstone, of the blood and seed of Aegon the Conqueror. 
I believe, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, this is the first time she utters, I am blood of the dragon. I do believe it is, and I believe, and I think this is kind of, in a way, this is the mantra, the internal monologue, the pep talk that she gives herself when she needs to step up, if you will, or yeah, to be brave in a moment. She gives her. This is the beginning of her starting to recognize that, like, she needs to give herself little internal pep talks. Absolutely. And some people have, even in our comment section, attempted to say that it's like an indication that she's going crazy because she talks to herself. And I was what? Like, and I, I actually said this to someone. I was like, clearly you've never like played sports or like done something where positive you're, you're self getting, talk. You're getting ready to get to do something that's you know, like you're getting yourself jacked up. You're getting yourself pumped up and ready to to go. It's just. It's just like all that positive self th- um, self talk that we speak about, and actually, it's not new in psychology. It's um, it's been around for a long time. It's what's your inner monologue with yourself? Do you say I can't do this? I I suck at this. Everyone has inner monologues. Yes, hers is she does it. I think, and and actually, I just searched for it in the iBook. This is the first time that she says, I am blood of the dragon. And it coincides uh, on the day that follows that dragon dream. She has the dragon dream. She gets in close proximity to the eggs. She has her first dragon dream. The next day she starts telling herself, I am blood of the dragon. And she uses it to find the strength within herself to overcome whatever stands in front of her that's difficult. Agreed. I'm not entirely sure that it was the very next day. But I do know that it's very soon after, regardless. They stayed in his man's wall. Oh, right. I guess I guess it it's, could have been a couple of It says of days. Un, she had never been so afraid until the day of her wedding came at last. Yes. So you're right. I guess it's not it, clear. It's not exactly clear whether or not it is the very you're next right. day or if that's like a couple of days or something before it actually ended up happening. But one way or another, it's within a matter of days. She has the dragon dream, and then she starts telling herself, I am the blood of the dragon. I can do this. I am Daenerys Stormborn, Princess of Dragonstone, the blood and seed of Aegon the Conqueror. This is the beginning of her kind of growing, stopping being afraid, which she makes reference to only a few paragraphs later when it comes time for the gifts. Right. She gets the eggs from Illyrio, which is obviously significant, the stories, the weapons from the blood riders that she gifts to Drogo, and then he gives her her silver. She gets on the silver, and she thinks to herself yes, that I'd... she forgot to be afraid. Absolutely. Maybe for the first time in her entire life, she was not afraid. Yes. Well, that that is coming up, but not to um, be too crazy about going in order. But yes, that that is definitely coming up in just a minute. Uh, so... That happens, and then the sun was only a quarter of the way up when she saw uh, the first man die. Uh, Shortly thereafter, she sees one of the warriors mount a woman right out in the open. (laughs) She turned away, but then others followed suit, and there was nowhere left to divert her eyes. So she's stuck here in this moment, having to watch basically barbarism, and um, she's very uncomfortable. Uh, it was when two men seized the same woman that a bloody duel ensued, ending as quickly as it began. Uh, Lirio explains to her that a Dothraki wedding with no deaths is considered to be a dull affair, so she deemed hers to be especially blessed, considering that a dozen men had died before the day was done. So this is just exposition into the Dothraki, and um, not to bring up the show, but the show did a decent job at this, at showing the wedding. Yes. I think if you wanted to go for a visual, for a, a book reader, that's I a good think... visual that you can latch onto and be like, okay, that's what it was like for her. Yes. Um, Feeling very isolated. She had no one to talk to. They did a good job of showing the Dothraki culture. I also think it's very interesting, and I know I might be stepping ahead a tiny bit, but just to compare Drogo's demeanor when his whole Kalisar can see him versus Drogo when his whole Kalisar is not watching him. 
is they're they're two very different people. Right. So here in front of the Kalzar, he's very guarded. He's very stoic. Maybe even considered a little standoffish. Yes. Serious. Not really turned towards her at all. So he, I picture him kind of. It's almost like he sits there like a statue the whole day. Yeah, absolutely. So yes, and then when they when we're gonna get into that in a moment when they have that time alone at the end of the day. Yes. Uh, it's it's actually completely different. So as the day goes on, Danny becomes more and more terrified of the strange people of her brother, and most of all, what would happen that night after the celebration between her and the giant of a man who sat next to her. So. She thinks, tonight I'm going to have to consummate my marriage. It's not just Dothraki custom where a marriage is consummated. Um, we see it in Westeros. They have the wedding ceremony. So she knows, tonight, after this is all done, I'm going to go be with this hut, my husband, and he is huge. And I've never done this before. And I'm young and I'm scared. And absolutely. So again, she tells herself, I am blood of the dragon. Uh, when the sun was setting, she's pre presented with her bride gifts. Uh, Viserys gives her three handmaidens, which were really gifted by Illyrio, because, like you said, Viserys has no money. <laughs> or anything. Yeah, has nothing. Uh, Jorah gave Danny a book on the Seven Kingdoms, and Magister Illyrio gives her the infamous or famous dragon's eggs. Uh, and other gifts are given to her by the Dothraki. She's absolutely mesmerized by the eggs. They basically take her breath away, and she kind of finds them to be the most beautiful things she's ever seen. They are fairly impressive looking. Yes. Illyrio tells her that they're dragon's eggs from the Shadowlands Beyond a Shy. BS. Yeah, <laughs> just shut up. That guy is just full of hot air. Li maybe literally. Potentially. <laughs> It also, I mean, th there's only a couple of options. There's the eggs that uh, Alyssa Farman stole. They happened to be three eggs that were in Bravos. That Drogo could have got his hands on. In one way, shape, or form. It seems entirely plausible that those are the eggs anyways. The three Targaryen eggs that went missing. Absolutely. He put that in fire and blood. Like, why would you put that there? Yeah. Um, it seems plausible. I doubt that they are from a shy. That's a lie. I doubt that too. He tells lies so easily. Yes, he is with full incredible grace. Of a lot a lot of hot air. Yes. His <laughs> words are wind. And if he's a glamour, it's literally hot air. Yes. <laughs> All right, so Drogo's Blood Riders presented her with three weapons, a leather whip from Hago, and a rock from Kaholo, and a dragon bow from Kotho, as bride, gift, bride gifts, which as tradition decreed, she was to politely decline, as it is not a woman's place to possess such weapons, and so uh, Illyrio had explained to her, when you receive these gifts, you're to bestow them on, actually, Drogo. Um... The last and greatest gift was given to her uh, last and by the call himself. A great white horse, which he says was silver for the silver in her hair. Illyrio explains that she is the pride of the Kalzar. As custom decrees, she must ride a horse worthy of her place by Drogo's side. Drogo places her on the horse and she is told to ride. So nervously, she gathers the reins and gives the filly a light touch with her legs. In response, her horse takes off, with the sea of Dothraki people parting before her. She becomes she comes upon a fire pit, and at that moment, a daring fills Danny that she had never known. I think it's interesting, the fire. Yes. That it's the fire. She doesn't fear it, and it actually gives her strength. Yes. Very interesting use of the elements there, George. Uh, she comes upon a fire pit, and um, she she leaps the flames, exhilarated. She tells Illyrio to tell Drogo that he has given her the wind. And after this had been translated, she sees Drogo smile for the first time. He was impressed. Yeah. And happy. He was happy. Well, I think I think the happy. whole thing thrilled him. I think she was good on the horse, and I think he was pleased that she liked his gift. Yeah, it was everything about it. Just like, he was like, this is good. Which also w gives you the first 
uh, indication that he's not that bad of a guy. He was happy to see her happy. Yes. I, I just wanted to go back to one more yeah, absolutely. piece of imagery that he puts in there. Yeah. When she gets to the the fire, mm-hmm. and a daring that she had never known filled Daenerys then, and she gave the filly her head. The silver horse leapt the flames as if it had wings. Mm. I think that's like a little bit of foreshadowing. I love Danny, it. Danny is going to fly as though, you know what I'm saying? She, and she does. And she does. Yeah. I, that, I digress though. No, let's that keep, was let's amazing. Keep, let's keep moving forward. Okay. So as even fall approached, uh, the calls horse was brought forth uh, as well. And before she was de- to depart with her new husband, Viserys threatens Danny. And that's when you said it kind of brings her fear back. So when she did that thing with the horse, she wasn't afraid. It's like she forgot to be afraid. But then here comes Viserys again to, you know, kind of mess with her, grab her, pinch her, hurt her, and threaten her with words. And then all of that fear comes back to her. The two of them ride off into the sunset, literally. (laughs) With Danny whispering aloud to herself, and this is out loud, she's saying, because she's scared. They're making this kind of like long sojourn out to this area of rocks. Like they're. They're going on their ceremonial first ride together. Yes. And uh, she is the blood of the dragon. She's feeling a little bit fearful. Once they reach their destination, Drogo swung off his horse and lifted her down from hers, at which point she began to cry. Drogo stared at her tears, said no, and wiped them away. Danny asks him if he speaks the common tongue, and he says no. Uh, and actually, just the fact that he knew one word of her language gave her comfort, because she thought to herself, it's one more word than I know of his. And just the fact that he made that effort and can say that one thing, it made her feel a little bit more comfortable. So I feel like this guy put in effort, and he's really into this. I don't think he sees her as property. He most certainly does not treat her like property. No. Not even from the very beginning, he does not. Like even on this day? Nope. He is very unlike the rest of the Dothraki. We have made a video about this. We've talked about it in live streams. He is completely unlike everybody else that he is surrounded by. And it's not just the fact that he is twice the size of everybody else. He also seems to have a way of thinking about things that are that is almost completely undothraki. He doesn't when for instance, when they're pillaging the in later chapters to raise the funds necessary to get ships to invade Westeros. Mm-hmm. When they're with the lamb people. His guys are all acting like degenerate animals. He's just sitting there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like, he's not really into that at all. He is very unlike everyone else that follows him. In fact, I would imagine that he became the leader, A, because he's the most ferocious dude you've ever seen, and he's twice the size of everybody else, but because he clearly thinks he he is more intellectual than the other people around him. He is smarter than the people around him. Because as we see, like with Ned and other battle commanders, he's never lost a battle. You don't just win every battle because you're huge. You win battles because you're smart. And this this part right here, um, after she said, is that the only word you know? Or do you know the common tongue? He said no. Drogo touched her hair lightly sliding the silver blonde strands between his fingers and murmuring softly in Dothraki. Danny did not understand the words, yet there was warmth in the tone, a tenderness she had never expected from this man. He wasn't what she expected him to be. He presents himself to be the king of the barbarians, but he doesn't really act like one. At all. I don't care he what likes anybody fine, says. He, he likes fine wine. He likes all kinds of things. And then we don't need to get into like the gruesome details of, of the what sex happens scene? next. No, I don't want to, but I do want to indicate just a couple of things. Um, 
He was very gentle. There's just some, because there's a, there's a major difference between the show and the books. And this channel doesn't compare the two, but a lot of people get something that they see stuck in their heads. Maybe not a lot of our people, but just in general. So they go back and forth. There's lots of nonverbal communication going on. You know, she undoes his braid. You know, he, he says, he starts pulling at his bell so she knows, okay, he wants me to do that too. Then or she actually just got up and started to help him. And then once she started doing it, he relaxed and let her yeah. do it. Um, he lifted her and seated her on a round rock. She said, is that the only word you know? He didn't reply. Uh, it took a long time. All the while, he just sat there silently watching her. When she was done, he shook his head and his hair spread out beneath him. So he has really nice hair. Uh, then it was his turn. He began to undress her. Um, his fingers were deft and strange, strangely tender. Um, when he did bare her breast, she averted her eyes and covered herself with her hands. No, he said. Um, and then... He gave her a massage. He made her, yeah. her to relax. And then he asked her... And then for a while, nothing happened. It actually says that. He stood her up then and pulled her close to remove the last of her silks. The night air was chilly on her bare skin. She shivered, and goose flesh covered her arms and legs. She was afraid of what would come next. But for a while, nothing happened. He sat there with his legs crossed, looking at her, drinking in her body with his eyes. Uh, and then and then he gave her the, the back massage, and it's, and then she thinks it seems as if hours had passed before his hands finally went to her breasts. And he doesn't do anything. He says no. Except this time she knew it was a question. And then she took his hand and moved it. To her happy place. And she said yes. yes. So that's a completely different scene from what the show did when uh, Amelia Clark was just getting where he ripped her clothes off <laughs> while she was weeping and bent her over and just obliterated her from behind. That is absolutely not what this was at all. At all. That, uh... I, and I believe that George was upset, if I remember correctly. He's, yes, I, there is an interview. Where uh, he was not happy about the way they depicted that scene because, like you had said before, George, as a man has absolutely no clue what it's like to be a girl about to lose their virginity. None. Yet he did a fairly realistic depiction. Of like, honestly, the most ideal way to lose it. Modern times, too. Like, I would say there's probably modern girls. That wish that theirs was as good as that. The, as sweet... Ten, like all of the things that took I remember reading that this scene after watching the show and being like that was so nice that like he was very gentle and very nice and very caring and it's hard to imagine it going better it, it actually couldn't have given what we were would all be expecting from the barbaric wedding where everyone's being slaughtered and just madness slave girls just getting sure had for back, lack of a better way to say it all over the place and then she's thinking Jesus what is going to happen to me tonight and then this is what happened, and it couldn't have been more different than what was expected. Mm hmm so, so, I think this is the end of this chapter, if I'm not mistaken. It is. So, thank you for listening, and... Uh, if you guys have any thoughts or comments or questions about our thoughts on this chapter uh leave a comment below
because yeah, I think we covered everything that I wanted to cover off the top of my head anyways. I don't think we I read that. it and listened to it and have and, and not to mention all the times we've done this before because we've done the extensive series on Danny. It's I've handpicked everything out of here. Um, so I but, would be very interested to see if anyone thought that we skipped anything or if you had any yeah, ideas. Yeah, I absolutely or, would. Or arguments against what we said here. But uh, thank you for listening and we'll catch you guys next time.